So remembering that doing intuitive art doesn't mean that we live in a vacuum or that it's somehow separate from all of our associations or inclinations. Remembering that working with our imagination and letting it be pure and spontaneous doesn't mean that it's without something to adhere to from nature or on the page. Beginning in that place, you're invited to play along with me to create an intuitive landscape, which I like to call dreamscapes or painted worlds. As you can see, I've started mine in a altered book. I liked the figure that was on this page. There was actually a quote about nature as well. So I picked the page pretty quickly, but based on those two things. And as I began, I remember at first I thought I'd leave the figure and then I ended up covering it with color. But you can still see the figure there and you'll see me shortly here begin to define the figure. The metaphors between nature and landscape and self are vast. <laughs> and I find myself reflecting all the time in my art on the inner landscape, on my own nature and wildness, on what it means to be a human in a form that so often feels separate, but that is of the elements of nature. We can't be human without these elements that make us up. All these non-human elements, right? And yet we have this gift of being able to be in this space and observe it with this consciousness. And then with our awareness, begin to pick up on and explore and allow to reveal itself that vast landscape of our unconscious as well. So you might have noticed I just had put some arms that were outstretched on her and immediately painted over them. And isn't, isn't that the beauty of acrylic? We can try something out and if we don't like it, just move forward. So some tips for beginning your page might be to pick um, a relative palette, like warm or cool. Here I leaned toward obviously the warm colors, and then I started to lean toward some purples, which start to move into the cool tones. But I had given myself one little challenge for this piece, and I, I suggest this from time to time for you in your creative practice as well. It can make it fun, and it can make the colors of the piece somehow pop and it's to choose a color that you'll leave out. And it can be a basic hue. Um, and sometimes, as I did for this piece, I like to choose one that I tend to lean toward. So I always tend to work with blue. I love blue. Turquoises, blues, teals that even lean on the blue side. Any shade of blue, dark blue, light blue, all of it. So I decided for this piece I would leave blue out and see what would happen. And purple is a nice, deep, rich color that did not fall into that little restriction I had placed on myself and gave this really surreal, surreal quality to the this landscape that I was beginning to kind of feel into on the page. When you're working in a book or on a piece that you're able to lay it on a table in front of you, it can be really good sometimes as you're especially laying down these initial layers to literally flip your page around and to break that familiarity or association that you have with what's happening on the page and see what kind of magic can come from just working with the color and the movement of color and layers. 
Here it almost looks like a whole other landscape is happening upside down at this point on my page. And then I'll flip it back over and see where I am with the page in the right orientation. So flipping our perspective in that way can be so helpful and fun to how we apply color and make something magical and unexpected happen that we couldn't have planned for. Taking into consideration those things that we kind of lightly touched on and explored, composition, value, contrast. What is the line movement around the page and how does that line direct the focal point as you look at the page? How does it direct the focus and the attention? What colors are laid up against one another and how do they, how do they create a dialogue between one another on the page? All of this can be really fun. And then considering what are the objects in the forefront, what's in the background. And also remembering that when you're creating dreamscapes, painted worlds, intuitive places that are just coming out of you in this spontaneous way, scale doesn't really matter as much. And in fact, playing with an unrealistic or surreal scale can add an element of interest as well and also speak about the visual story that is unfolding and telling itself through you. And always remembering that the lines and the movements that you make can be so simple and to keep coming back to them. Switch your brushes, play with line, explore pattern, explore rather than the realistic quality of something you might be envisioning, how can a pattern imply that? Really play with that sort of thing. And then how can a simple shift in value like a darker value beneath and then passing over the object again with a lighter value, how can that create dimension on the object or the area that you are working with? Very simple things and really fun to play with. And in a practice, that's really all we're doing. We're, we're playing and we're seeing what comes of it. Now, when I flipped open my book to begin this page, I had really no intention of having a human form in it, form in it, but I went with my quick decision and interest in the page that I chose, and then my inclination to possibly include a similar form as what was already on the page. Now, I'll give you a hint. If you're relatively new to figure drawing or working with the body form, sometimes silhouettes or like solid colors, whether it's black or another color, that can be a really great way to imply the form on a page in a way that feels technically adept. But if you can let go of the need for it to be rendered in a sort of pleasing way and you're up for the exploration, right? Then go ahead and give a shot at rendering that human form in whatever way feels true to you, whether it be decorative and doodle doodlicious <laughs> or sketchy or it be with uh, more realistic tones like I'm doing here. Um, and be patient with the process. You might have to paint over parts and rework different parts or stop for a minute and look at a source and see what comes to you. Uh, the human form is as complex as any landscape and obviously 
such a beloved subject of artists throughout time. So really be patient as you work with anything that resembles a human form. And also consider exploring the way in your landscapes you might see a reference of a human form. And how can you let the reference remain as is without making it more realistic, for instance, as an actual human in the presence of that landscape? So as you could tell, it, it took me a little bit of work to get that form and the shadows and the placement of the arm to a place where I was pleased with it, where it felt um, complete for this image. And then I moved to the hair. And working with hair, if you um, worked in essence with me, you know I, I work in layers, dark to light. Um, so dark to highlights, typically. It's a nice quick way to move toward hair and I do a lot of scratching into the wet paint to imply the strands of hair and give it a little bit of texture on the page as well. I like to use the colors, once I have established my palette, like the warm tones here in the purple, and not, not pulling out my blues, and then I have some greens as well. Once I've established my palette and have some wet colors on the palette next to me, those are the colors that I would then use to blend, to create the neutrals for the page. For instance, the gray tone. Um, or shades that are somehow in between or if I want to create a green tone but that isn't as bright and doesn't pop as much as some of the other greens then I might mix a little bit of the yellow ochre or that light orangish tone in with the green and see what comes of it so practice mixing your palette colors too and how can those neutral tones then become like the earth and how can they create a sense of that earthiness in the landscape that you're creating it really will add a richness and and you will also learn something about mixing the vast array of browns and grays that are out there by mixing your hues I'm recording my comments later because I really believe it's important to allow ourselves to get lost when we do dreamscapes, to get lost in the landscape on the page or the canvas in front of you. And truly, that's the only way I could give you a real authentic um, glimpse of how my practice works when I create a visual story or a dreamscape or a painted world in this way. I needed it to be in my own space. I needed to be in my own inner world. So I had music playing, um, but I was really there present to my page. And so what that means is moving over the page, all the little areas again and again, a little detail here, a little detail there. And right now you can see I'm filling in some of the underneath layers with a color I had used previously, because sometimes blocking in color then can really make other areas of texture pop or certain objects that we want to be a focal point. Uh, when we block in the color around it, it can really make those pop. So play with that as well. What are the areas that are asking for a second or third coat of the same color from you?
And you might ask yourself, what is that color that is just so special to you? The one that you always are drawn toward. Maybe there's a couple, and one of mine is turquoise, but I was not going to work with blues on this page. So I chose my second favorite at this point, which is, is gold. Um, I use gold sparingly and intentionally as highlights often on hair if the hair is similar to my own for instance or has a golden hue to it but also as these little accents and decorative elements in these sort of magical worlds so what is your magical color the color that you just love that you want to kind of add to everything <laughs> One of the simplest keys to adding a little magic to a dreamscape is to remember contrast, so light over dark or dark within light, as you're adding small elements in pattern and doing these little elements that are highly contrasted that pop on the page, like the leaves, little buds on the tree or little flowers in the land beneath. What's the pattern? What's the contrast? How does it how does it make that space feel just a little bit like it's been sprinkled with glitter, even if you're not a glitter girl, which I am not. <laughs> so once I finished painting this piece, my next step then is to come into it with my, my favorite pens and pencils, my mark makers. It becomes a more intimate process then for me. Here's the images once I finished painting, and it's hard to capture some pen marks that I do in my final stages on video, so I'll just share some images with you of the final piece beneath the video. <laughs> 